there, and um, welcome to this one-off episode of uh, sewing projects that I have most loved and enjoyed doing over the past, let's see if Angus was a year old when I started sewing, seven years, because he's now eight. So I came up with this idea because I had done the top five Stitch Fix pieces that I liked um, in all the time I've been ordering from Stitch Fix, and I'm like, wait a second, I bet people, you know, in the sewing community, and maybe some of you who aren't necessarily sewers yourself, you might enjoy this because you're interested in the craft of making your own clothes and what goes into it. And over the past um, seven years of my life, I've made a lot of projects. And so narrowing it down to top five was really hard. So I went ahead and went with my top seven. And my top seven are definitely not the ones that like I found easy breezy, lemon squeezy. These were the ones that were like, took me a long time and a lot of effort and energy to do, but the result was so amazing that they found their way into my top seven. So I'm giving you a little bit of um, information before you actually dive into this, just in case you're looking for ones that are like, these are not my top seven easiest. Um, these are not my top seven most wearable. These are the top seven because I felt like with each of these, I accomplished something pretty great. And when I do wear them or when I see people wearing the item that I made, um, it gives me a lot of joy because I remember the craft and the, and the time and the energy and the couture methods that had to go into it in order to make the items that I created. Um, so I, I hope you enjoy this. And um, if you are a sewer, it's not going to be often that I do these sorts of things because I don't tend to do sewing um, videos, but I am more than happy to do videos related to like patterns and ones that I like or projects I've enjoyed, easiest projects, most difficult projects, fabric I hated working with, fabric I love working with. And those are items, those are sorts of videos that I could see myself potentially making. Typically I am a blogger, I mean, excuse me, a YouTuber who does um, things that are related to reviewing um, clothing items and or boxes, um, like subscription boxes, etc. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with my number seven choice on my top seven sewing projects. And it's actually the one I'm wearing, which is um, a Vogue blue and white um, patterned dress. This is Vogue 1499. And this was one that I actually made um, with Fabric Mark Fabrics. For those of you who don't know, um, Fabric Mark um, is one of my go-to fabric shops because for, well, one thing, they're super close to Virginia and in Pennsylvania. And so their fabrics come pretty quickly. And when I was doing a lot more sewing, it was nice to be able to get patterns, excuse me, fabrics and get them turned around pretty quickly in projects. Now that I don't sew as much, um, I don't get as many fabrics because I've got plenty in my stash, but Fabric Mart has really nice um, fabrics that they get from um, the more, um, so, you know, the, the actual uh, designers and fashion houses, especially in uh, the big city. So I think they um, source theirs from New York City in the garment district. Um, this, um, this, excuse me, this blue and white dress is actually made from a fabric. I, re I don't recall off the top of my head um, which designer, I believe it may have been Anne Klein. It may be an Anne Klein pattern, but I will look it up and actually place all the information that I'm talking about next to me in the space that I've created with my um, videotaping. So what you'll see over here is I'll probably put up the pattern. So Vogue 1499 probably just showed. And um, I have actually, information about who did this um, fabric because I found this fabric um, online uh, in a dress that was made about the same time I was making my dress, or maybe it was a year or two older. Um, so, and I can put that up here right now. Um, so this was uh, made into a beautiful dress with a very similar uh, style of uh, layout of the, the pattern itself on the fabric. The reason I liked using Vogue 1499 was because it allowed me the flexibility of working with this gorgeous fabric. So this is a border print fabric and it was made for that company in order for the dress itself to have a border at the hem and I, or at the waistline. I can't remember if it was the waistline or at the hem or both. Um, I chose not to have the border on this fabric. Um, actually, at the waist, I wanted it to be this beautiful center um, sun motif. Um, it reminds me a little bit of like a Greek motif or maybe a, a, a Dutch Delftware um, sort of ceramic pattern. Um, so I really wanted the, the centerpiece to be this beautiful sun motif, floral motif right there. 
And um, the reason I enjoyed making this particular project so much was because it required so much effort on my part in laying out the fabric just so that when the final outcome was realized, I saw a dress that was something from far away that would turn heads. And I made sure that it fit me very precisely. In fact, I always have to like make sure I don't gain too much weight because otherwise it doesn't fit me through the waist. It's very cinched in. I wanted something where the, the, the patterning, the way I laid it out with the Vogue 1489 um, pattern pieces would be something that would draw the eyes up, out, and then into the waist and then back out to that beautiful border print at the hemline. And so the process of doing that involved a lot of work on my part of placing the fabric pieces onto my dressmaker dummy, which I'll show you here. And once I started to like get a look at it, I realized this was going to work. And so it was worth the extra effort. I would say you had to, I had to make sure that the pattern pieces were laid out precisely on the fabric itself. And then I needed to ensure that once it was on the dressmaker dummy, that the first thing you would see is this gorgeous floral motif. And then I needed to make sure that it would look well with the bottom skirt as, as much as possible. And so I probably spent, I would say, at least four or five hours just simply cutting out, placing pattern pieces, placing them on the dressmaker dummy, etc. So in the end, I ended up wearing it to an auction that was Greek themed the year that the auction, the I don't recall what year it was, but it was a few years back. And I ended up um, doing a blog post about it over at Fabric Mart because for a long time I was blogging with them. And so I'll make sure to link to all of the blog posts that I have um, associated with these different items. There's only one item that does not have a blog post and I don't know why I didn't write it, but that's okay because I can talk about it here. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and show you just some photos of either me wearing the item or me actually creating the item and the process of creating the item. So it'll be process first. Um, I will make sure to also include photos of me wearing it. And I've had this piece for, I believe, I think it's four or five years now. And every time I wear it, I get compliments on it. And so it is definitely worthy of my number seven choice. I hope you enjoyed the little slideshow of items related to the Vogue 1499 blue and white uh, dress. And now we're moving on to my number six item, which is a swimsuit that I made just last summer in 2019. It is behind me. I decided to wear the blue and white dress because it is the most wearable of all the items here. Pretty sure you all don't want to sit there. Maybe some of you do <laughs> while I'm wearing a swimsuit. So I decided that I would just wear this one and then move along with the rest of the pieces. Of all of the pieces here, only two of these are wearable on a regular basis. So um, that is why I stuck with the blue and white dress. This is actually another make um, for Fabric Mart um, in their blog. And so you'll see the blog post down below. This is actually a Millie fabric. Um, and that was sourced through um, Fabric Mart last summer. And it is uh, made from the um, pattern J. Lee Diana swimsuit. And I think it's a very versatile pattern. And because um, they're really good at patterning, uh, I, I think they're an exceptional pattern company. They're out of, I believe, Montreal and Quebec. And um, they have it in both French and in English. And they have sizes that go from little, little girls all the way to adult women. And this one, um, the directions were pretty well written and there were um if i remember correctly i think there was even a um like a follow along a sew along on their website or at least they gave instructions on how to do things a little bit more clearly on their blog um so if i find that i'll make sure to link to that as well um the combo of the two of them of the um pattern itself this beautiful beautiful swimsuit fabric and the shape of the swimsuit 
was just very appealing to me. I am a swimmer. I swim laps on a regular basis. So I, if I'm going to spend the time making a swimsuit instead of purchasing it, I'm going to buy one that I know I'm going to be able to swim laps in. Um, but that will also be gorgeous because to make a swimsuit actually takes a little bit of time and it takes a lot of patience and energy spent on, you know, being sure to very carefully um, pull the, the elastic as you're sewing it on the machine, making sure that you have the time and energy to devote to, if you don't have a serger, um, sewing the two, the lining and the outer uh, swimsuit fabric together. So all of that made this fabric and that pattern worth my time okay it took me a long time to do it again this is another one that has a big huge like floral print on it and when you have these bigger prints you need to make sure that you are not putting things in places where it may look especially on a swimsuit a little bit like oh you placed the daisy right here and the daisy eye is right there so it, you, you, just because you don't want to like you know, I, I don't know, be provocative. Maybe some of you do, but I don't really want to be provocative when I'm walking around in front of a bunch of children at a swimming pool locally. <laughs> so I, I wanted to make sure that the fabric placement was done in such a way that it wouldn't lend itself to, Ooh, why did you put that there? <laughs> so um, the actual um, inside fabric is not a swimsuit fabric, I believe. Um, it was another, it's another fabric mart one. It is um, an, it's um it's an athletic, uh, like an athleisure type fabric, and but it has the stretch that you need. So when I was doing the Diana pattern, they have the things where you can put it and do the stretch test to make sure it has enough elasticity in both directions. Because with swimsuits, you have to make sure it can go this way as well as up and down. And so the uh, athleisure fabric that I found, which is in this nice tan color, which is a good one when you have white underneath because any other color would show through. Um, so that was a nice combo and to make it required me just to spend a lot of time being very careful on my sewing machine and making sure that um, the elastic as I was sewing it was being sewed on well enough that if I stretch it really far it's going to stay and go back to the position it needs to. So it's not so much that it was especially difficult it was more of just having to be very careful because pop stitches on a swimsuit are not an ideal situation. And so I am going to tell you that um, this is a good pattern to choose if you enjoy, uh, you'd like to try your hand at swimwear and just make sure that if you're gonna spend the time and energy that you purchase high quality swimwear fabric. This Millie one is just exceptional. It's very thick. It's beautiful. It's worn well. I've worn it a handful of times since last summer and I no fading yet. And make sure that you're using a nice thick fabric on the inside too. You want these things to last. Yes, I know we can buy a swimsuit for $75, but sometimes it's nice to, to take on a challenge like this and say, I made my swimsuit because I got a ton of compliments on this last summer. And they were like, you made your swimsuit? And I'm like, I absolutely did make my swimsuit. And so just because of the sheer commitment and the amount of time I had to spend on it and the amount of like just very precise energy and making sure everything was perfect, um, this made it number six. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and show you uh, the patterning process and then I will show you how it looks on me. Hope you enjoyed the swimsuit photos next up i have my fifth choice which is a flapper dress that i wore to um an auction another auction last year it was in 2019 um, and then i wore it again to a 20s themed party in 2020 and this is a new look uh 63 73 pattern and um what's going to surprise you is you're going to look and see the pattern right next to me and be like 
Well, that doesn't seem like a very difficult pattern at all. And it isn't, it's not like, if this was just made out of like a denim material or like a nice lightweight, lightweight um, cotton, you know, lawn or something, then it wouldn't be such, it would not have made it to the level of, let's talk about it as my number five happiest, best sewing project. So the thing with this one is that it was the amount of time and energy I put into not only the creation of this dress, but also the amount of energy that was required researching what dress I was going to even make. So I knew that I wanted to do a flapper dress, like an authentic looking one. And um, I knew that the patterns from that time period would be uh, exorbitantly expensive and they don't have the modern conveniences like, you know, they, they used to use like punched out dots to represent like where seams would meet up. And I, I didn't want to even bother with any of that if I could, because we're trying to turn it around in about two weeks. And I knew that I was going to be using this very thin, thin silk chiffon. I mean, this is a designer fabric. I believe it's like one of those that if this was to be in the stores, it would be one of those high end um, couture kind of um, uh, or very high end design houses. Um, it is very sheer. It is, it's a silk and a, um, a poly um, sheer uh, burnout velvet. And these, the velvet itself is actually a, um, is the silk part. And then you have a very thin, 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 actually it might be silk chiffon underneath. And I knew that this fabric per yard, I mean, I bought it for, I think, I think on sale it was like $45 it was very expensive and I knew that if I was going to spend all that energy and time sewing this it to be fair it's beautiful fabric but god it's terrible to work with it's so hard it requires a lot of energy and effort to sew this fabric um, I needed a pattern that would be at, at least relatively easy to sew and also would evoke that kind of 1920s flapper look. So after a lot of research, I settled on the new look 6373, and it was because it reminded me of two dresses that I had found in archives. Um, one of those like vintage, uh, they, they show off vintage fashions. I think one is in a museum somewhere. Anyhow, the process of creating this gorgeous, I mean, it's a really beautiful dress. When it's all said and done, I think I did a very nice job. Laying this fabric out, even on a simple pattern like the New Look 6373, because it's shifty and thin, I had to spend, I think, laying out the fabric on the pattern no less than, if, I'm not even exaggerating when I say probably four hours just to lay it out precisely, pin it up just so, so that way it wouldn't be off. I'm really glad I did not choose something fitted with this fabric because that would have been a nightmare and I can't even imagine trying to do that. Um, and then in the end, making sure that I didn't lose the fabric itself in the process of pinning the pieces together in order to be sewn. Um, in the end, I ended up deciding to go ahead and I matched my under lining, which is, um, this is a, just a regular, it's a nicer, I think it's a David's Bridal, like chiff, uh, not chiffon, but like a um, poly lining. And the two together, um, I just, normally I wouldn't do this, but I decided to, to make the pieces come together like so, and then treat it as one um, piece together because if I had attempted to, um, I, I, I sewed up like the dartings and things first, but then I, I went ahead and met, uh, put the two pieces together because sewing together chiffon by itself and then trying to attach a lining, I just, it gave me very big, like just, I couldn't even imagine. I was just, I, could, I started itching thinking about it because when you have to do something that laborious, and on a machine, oh yes. Um, and all of the sewers out there who've worked with chiffon type materials completely understand my my issues. <laughs> so um, I ended up, it ended up being the right choice because um, it gives the dress a little bit of, of heft. So it's not, it lays much better because it is 
attached to that underlining. And it also means that this, that this slip underneath does not shift um, with, with on its own. It, it works together as a cohesive piece. And then what makes it even nicer is I don't have to, my undergarments don't have to be precisely a certain color or whatever. Um, I mean, I guess I could have just sewn the chiffon dress and then put a slip underneath it, but I really like the ability to have this kind of heft and, and feel to it. It has a nice sound to it and um, it, it wears very well. And actually, considering it's such a delicate fabric, um, it's, it's done very well in the times I've worn it and there haven't been any issues with um, any any damage. So um, I think I think I've got a winner here and I do plan on wearing it many years in the future. I love the color and I think it is very much uh, of the style that a flapper would have worn. And so I was very proud of myself. So because of that, that is why it is my number five choice sewing project. And you can see the process of laying out and all that stuff and it on me here. place is actually not one that I made for me. It is a piece I wore before it was made for someone else. I'm going to show you a hint. It's right here. This is a photograph of me with my dad and my aunt and my uncle. And my aunt and my uncle, may they rest in peace, were some of my most favorite people on the planet. Here I am wearing my communion dress at age, I think I was eight at that point. And this dress here had been handmade by, for me by one of our neighbors that I was, um, that we were really good friends with. It was made out of a cotton eyelet fabric. It was probably a poly cotton, if I'm remembering correctly. I've got the, the actual dress that I made for my daughter from my dress, um, if I remember. It had that kind of feel of like, uh, it was sturdy, but it was definitely eyelet. And I could see that the amount of time that she spent making my dress um, meant that she did it with a lot of love. And yes, I could have just handed my daughter the dress and said, okay, honey, you get to wear my vintage dress. And actually a lot of women do that. They'll let their daughters wear their dress from that era. Um, but I decided I wanted to do something that I think is distinctly very couture. Most of the pieces you've seen here with the amount of time and energy I've had to put into it, I lean towards the couture because you have to do the specific pattern placements. You have to be very careful with how you're, sometimes you have to hand sew before you do things. This one I didn't even have a pattern for, so there is no pattern for this piece. Um, I had to create for my daughter her communion dress, and it is, it's underlining, just like with the flapper dress, there's an underlining and the pieces are attached together. The underlining is my original dress, and um, I kind of love that this really beautiful little dress that I had back when I was eight years old has become the basis for her dress um, when she was seven. And they, they don't do communion in third grade here, they do it in on seventh grade. Although, strangely enough, Angus, it was his communion year this year, he couldn't do it when he was in third in second grade because of the COVID thing. So he'll actually be in third grade and eight years old, just like his mother was. I made for Rex, I'll show you very quickly, I made for Rex his communion outfit and I still have his um, jacket. And so Angus will most likely wear um, a, the jacket that Angus, uh, excuse me, that Rex wore back when he was uh, in second grade. I have a really big desire to have handmade items for very special events like that. Oh, and speaking of that jacket I made for Rex, that took forever. That thing was very, I mean, you make a jacket, you have to spend a lot of time making sure that the lapels are just so and et cetera, et cetera. So. I, I love I loved spoiling my kids when it's worth it. So what I'm gonna do first is just show you the underlining because I want you to see the original dress. It's still pretty much intact. You see the eyelet and you can see her original stitching. And you can see that they added, this is this, this, this um, that was the eyelet fabric. This here is a little bit different. It's more of a textured cotton. So what I ended up doing was I took apart the original dresses at the seams. I literally hours and hours just with the seam ripper, very carefully taking apart the seams of the original dress. 
because I wanted to have the original pieces on which to lay the gorgeous fabric. This fabric, by the way, was purchased from Emma One Sock, and she, like Fabric Mart, will get these gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous fabrics from design houses, and this is um, one that just is exquisite, and I remember spending some money on it and just thinking it was completely worth it. I bought it partially because I liked the scallop design, and I knew that that would be a beautiful border for the the see the sleeve hem as well as the hem of the dress so it's kind of hard to tell but let me see i can pull it up so you guys can take a closer look um, let me see i think so you can see the the scalloping of the hem so after i took all of the seams apart i laid out the fabric on it and cut the pieces out precisely to what i was seeing on the under layer of my original dress and then I carefully sewed the pieces together. And then I reconstructed the dress without the puffy sleeves. I decided the puffy sleeves, although it is very much that era that I was eight years old in, I decided she needed a more modern interpretation. So I made cute little cap sleeves instead. I can show you how those look from the inside to see what I did. It's a bit sticky because I zip, the zip itself, I think I should have used a little a different zip than I chose. But I ended up using a um, ended up using one of those bias tapes to secure the edges of the sleeve. Um, I do recall all of this process taking a really, really long time, and I ended up I even before I was able to construct it fully together, I actually ended up taking, and if you see here, I actually created I, I seamed it up, but then before I put in the zipper. I created the belt detail here, right here. This is actually the original, um, uh, it was like a, a trim that was on my dress in a few different places. So if you look, I believe it was at my neckline, some of it, and then I believe somewhere else on the dress was also that, that beautiful material. And um, so I used the trim from the original dress and put it on the outside because although I wanted the dress itself to look more modern, I wanted there to be a piece from the original dress that you could see visible outside the dress. Because clearly you can see the dress if you lift, if you lift up the lace, you can see the original dress. It's, it's the underlining. So you know that the dress itself was once upon something, once upon a time something else but you don't have anything to show that it's an original piece um, and that the original piece had something. So I, I added this trim here to add the element of the old with the new. And so it, it, it actually ended up working really nicely together. And I really wish I had, I thought I had taken photographs of the process, but I, I must not have because I've been looking around and I can't even find it on like my Facebook. Um, I only have a handful of photos of her in this dress, and so I'm going to show those to you, but that's why I've spent a little bit more time showing you the individual, like, couture por portions of it, where I, like, very carefully constructed it together, because I don't have the photos to show you the process, and so you're just going to have to live with the couple of photos I have of her wearing it back when she was seven years old. She tried to rewear it when she was nine. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> so... It was definitely a one-time occasion thing, but boy, um, what a one-time occasion thing to, to do it for. She actually was bringing up the gifts uh, for First Holy Communion. She was one of the two that was chosen to bring up the gifts. And so that was also part of the reason I spent so much time and energy on this. And I really hope that when she has a little girl that her daughter will wear it. Um, that would be lovely. And my goddaughter, my, my um brother's daughter who was just born in Mar uh, February. I would really love it if she wore it when she's seven years old. I think that would be very sweet. So it can be like a family heirloom piece. And all that because someone loved me enough at eight years old to make one for me. And that's why this one is my third favorite make ever. Okay, so my second most favorite make ever is one that if you've been following the Fabric Mark blog for a long time, you're going to definitely recognize. It is a coat that took me almost a month to create, and I definitely chronicled its 
beautiful creation on the fabric, fabric mark blog and so i'm definitely going to be linking to that because i want you all to see the process of that for sure this is actually a combo piece it's a frankenstein piece because the collar is actually from mccall's 7024 and the um, coat itself is vogue 8626 um, and i love this coat and when i wear it it's like I, people are like, what is that coat? And I'm like, I made this coat. So they get all excited Wait, before I actually pin it up. Before I show it off, I'm gonna put it back up so you can see how the collar looks. The collar is the coolest part. So the collar itself, like I wrote on the Fabric Mart blog, um, I chose this particular coat because I like the very feminine design. And it's another one where if I gain weight, oh geez, I don't know if I can wear it around my waist. So I have to be very careful. Um, but this collar is very evocative of a J. Crew, a couple of J. Crew jackets and coats that I own. And I love the drama of this particular kind of collar with the pleating detail. And I wasn't sure initially whether or not this collar, because it was McCall's, would fit in with the Vogue um, coat. But because they're like sister companies, I think they use the same base pattern. And so it was, it, was, it actually fit perfectly in the size that I chose um, because. I think they have again that base pattern matching and so it, it lined up beautifully and it ended up being a very good choice on my part because the original coat had one of those that's just a traditional collar but this this dramatic collar just really you look at this it's like it's perfect for Christmas time and I often will wear it during December because of Christmas the amount of energy though that it took to create this coat oh my goodness I have an original um, like a Vogue Courtier or a Vogue uh, Paris original coat that was made years ago and I bought it off of eBay for like $12. And I looked at that thing in detail to see what couture things they added to their coat. There was an underlining, an inner lining, there was um, hand stitching, there was all sorts of, there were patterns, there were even weights within the hem to keep the hem nice and like weighted because a lot of times you don't want the, you don't want your coat flying up. It was an incredible, beautiful item. And so I'm like, well, I'm going to go ahead and spend a month on this then because I wanted there to be a piece that I would have forever and that I would take incredibly good care of. So everything down to the way the buttons were chosen to the way I had to um, do the top stitching to the fact that I chose this particular collar to the way the pockets were um, positioned on the side. I even added within the pockets, you know, you can just do regular lining material, but no, I chose to go with the lining material. That's the lining of the coat itself. I'm sorry, I'm struggling to get out, but that, it's this beautiful floral. And all oh, my stuff is falling off because I'm <laughs> trying to show you all this random stuff. So the, um, I'll go ahead and open it up because I think those of you who are watching this are probably wanting to see the inside because with a coat, it's a little bit different than just a dress. Okay, so I do use a very nice heavy and I make sure the plastic is inside it because I want it to stay nice and um, I don't want it to get crushed or anything in the um, in the coat closet. So I even have like in so when you see the inside, I mean, look at this. It's <laughs> this lining is just divine. It's actually a Joanne lining, and it's got a little bit of stretch. And I even have a handmade with love tag up there. And I accidentally, when I was creating it, I forgot to put this. I cannot believe I forgot this. I forgot to put the shoulder pads in the inside until it was too late, and I'm like, oh dang it. So I went ahead and just covered them with the lining and then added the shoulder pads after the fact. And it actually turned out okay. So I was like, all right. I had to, you're not gonna believe this, I had to hand stitch the entire sleeve hem to the sleeve, to the lining, the, I'm sorry, the sleeve lining to the sleeve itself. It was, that took me for freaking ever to do. I just remember spending hours and hours on this project. And so, I definitely, it was a labor, a labor of love for sure. And um, the way I had to add, you know, just even like getting the lining to match up perfectly here. And then now I'm gonna pull this up because I did not connect the hem to the, let me show you this way. This looks heavy. I, I didn't connect the two pieces. I guess I could add one of those things where you stitch in like a carrier piece that allows it to have movement. I didn't want to stitch them together because if I did that, then the lining itself might tug and not feel right. 
And so I left it open in the hem free. I hemmed all the pieces together. I hand hemmed this part, but I actually am glad I didn't put it together too carefully, like in the sense that it is not stitched together perfectly. I don't wanna do that. In fact, I probably never will because I want the free um, lining down here because I feel like it will, it just, it won't, sometimes if you do it too tightly, it'll, it'll affect the fit of the entire lining. And those of you who know what I'm talking about probably agree. So here is the way, this is the inner lining. So I, I completely interlined it with this Batiste cotton and then I hand stitched the hem up so you don't see the hem itself from the outside. Now the, the lining hem is a mach machine stitched. I can't actually go into the very intricate details, but with coats you want to do and make sure you have structure. And so a good portion of this coat is actually, um, in addition to being interlined and lined, it has a um, sturdy kind of a horse, it's not, they call it horse hair, but it's like, it's this type of, um, lining that you can either iron in or you can sew in and it gives structure to the, the piece. So you do this on things like if you have a very full skirt and you want the skirt to stay puffed out, you put that in the hem so it will stay puffed out. If you have a coat, it allows the coat to have the structure that's needed. Um, and all of the pieces you'll see in the process and the photos that I'm going to show you in just a minute will show you what I'm talking about, how parts of the coat have that extra structure in it. And that is why this thing has lasted for as long as it has lasted. Um, in addition to that, because I made a mistake when I was top stitching the waistband, I was like, I am not going to spend a gazillion hours on this project and have a horrible looking top stitch um, juncture at the waistline in the back. So what I ended up doing is I added this type of um, belt and it's got a very specific name and I mentioned it in the, um, in the blog post, but it added, that mistake ended up leading to this, this um, back piece, which I think adds a little bit of flair and drama to the back. So in the end, even the mistakes led to things that were successful on the coat. And so um, <laughs> you can tell why this would be my second favorite because it is just something that if you're gonna do it, you do it the best you can because you don't, you're not gonna scrimp on something like this. If you, if you, if you really wanna make something successful, you spend the time and energy on it. And um, it is definitely a head turner and it is one of my most favorite projects ever. It is not my most favorite though, which may surprise some of you because the amount of time I spend on it, it should be, right? I've got one more that I love even more. Enjoy the photos of this one. Next up, I have the fourth most favorite sewing project, and this is one that if you follow the Fabric Mark blog and you've been following it for years, you'll recognize immediately. It is the project that allowed me to win the Fabric, Fabric Mart, Fa, I think Fabricista, there was a contest every year for a while. They don't do it anymore, I don't believe. But um, for a while there, between I think six to eight participants would be on a sew-off every week, and we'd get a project to do. And I somehow made it to the end of that, even though I had only been sewing for two years or so at that point. And I won because of this blouse. Um, up until that point, I hadn't even won any of the weekly contests. I had just sort of slid on through in that safe position. You know, they always talk about it on Project One. Like, oh, I'm always safe. I'm never on the bottom, I'm never on the top. I'm always safe. Well, to be fair, the week before this one won, I was actually in, the bottom two and I just barely made it into the last week of competition against the two other sewers um, and we were meant to make an art project. It was based on art. It doesn't mean it had to be art but it was based on art itself 
And anybody who knows me knows my love of mid-century modern art, and I love Jackson Pollock, and I love his wife, Lee Krasner, just as much. And so my inspiration for this particular blouse came from the combo of Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock and how their marriage was as a unit. And um, if you, this is definitely something, if you're into art history, you'd want to read more about because the amount of time and energy I put into just writing my blog post about it involved a lot of the art history involving their couple and their their how they work with each other um, in their artwork. So, but the process of making this is what actually makes this my um, fourth choice. It, this is not a difficult pattern at all. In fact, this is the Simplicity 1590. It is a vintage pattern, and I chose the vintage pattern because it's from the era that Lee Krasner would have been alive um, and in her, I believe, early 30s. And I thought this may have been something she would have liked to have worn. And so it's got this cute little peplum on the bottom. And it's got these, I mean, if you look, the buttons themselves look vintage. And I even sort of, it's this nice, beautiful linen, very lightweight um, linen that you find on summer dresses and such. Um, and, it, you know, it took, a, it took a little bit of doing. It wasn't, it was not a very difficult pattern. But I decided because I really liked the idea of what he did and what she did with their art, I wanted to try it myself. So I went to the Joanne Fabrics with my daughter and, or it may have been my son actually, Rex, and he helped me pick out these colors of um, fabric paint. And then what I did is I took the pieces as they were cut out and I splatter painted, like I splattered the paint on them. I used a combo of the fabric paint itself and a little bit of water to make it a little less thick. And then I just kind of went to town. And um, that process you'll see in just a moment um, when I show all the pictures of the process of making this. And in the end, I wasn't sure how it was gonna look, but it ended up looking pretty cool. And I was excited by what I had. And I'm like, well, I don't know if this is gonna be special enough to win the competition, but I had a ton of fun making it. And I figured at the very least they'd see that I love art history, that I love, mid-century modern art and that um, I was willing to go there and do a Jackson Pollock-esque shirt um, in that era or of that era. I even, I don't know if you can tell this, I added a little bit of piping in a navy blue so it just had that extra little detail. Anyhow, so I even set it up. They asked you if, if you're going to do your art, uh, your art um, inspired piece, you need to make sure you set up a photo shoot to make it look like something from that era. Well, I happen to own a yellow chair um, that is uh, definitely vintage. It is actually worth some money because it is a vintage piece from the early 1970s. And I figured although it's not 1950s, it has that, it's that, that type of chair, the Herman Miller chair that, you know, was around in the 50s and 60s. And I figured, well, it's close enough. And so it, it worked together and I put on this very vintage looking outfit from the time period. And I think it was, from what I understand, all th all of our pieces were beautiful. One was a yellow trench coat, and the other one was, a, I think it was a beautiful white suit. I mean, all of us did a really good job on our pieces. And I think I ended up winning because of just the, um, what the, they told me they liked my blog post, but they also really enjoyed just how I just completely went for it with the painting and then creating the piece to evoke that era. I do wear it from time to time. It's a little bit like this piece. I have to be very careful and make sure I don't gain any weight right here because it definitely is one of those cinched in pieces, but um, really was, really was one of my most favorite pieces to create. And you know, I ended up winning the Fabric Mark contest and I was like, oh my gosh, I've literally never won anything in my entire life and I go and win this. And I was pretty excited about it. So I hope you enjoy looking at the process and the photos here. And here I am now with my last choice, my first favorite, my most favorite sewing project that I have ever done. And it is one that if you follow me on Instagram, you actually saw me wear very recently because I was celebrating 
my 999th Instagram post. And I decided that if I'm gonna do my 999th Instagram post, it's gonna be something special. So I ended up choosing the Vogue Courtier design, Valentino of Italy, Vogue 2439. This is a 1971 pattern, and it is my most favorite make. It was time consuming. It is something that I had to like put a lot of thought into. But the sheer joy I had making this and the sheer joy I have wearing this makes this just the ultimate piece in, in my estimation. Because it is a courtier um, design, it is not an easy one. And when I pull out the pattern um, pieces in a moment, you'll see why. Um, the, the people, the home sewer, back in the um, 50s, 60s, 40s, 70s, they had these designers um, make these pieces for their own lines and then they would allow the home sewer to recreate them. And so there are Pierre Carvin ones there, there are Yves Saint Laurent ones, I mean you name it, they are the big big bads of the uh, fashion world and between the 40s and the 70s all allowed for their designs to be um, used by the home sewer. I mean, Diane von Tristenberg, her iconic wrap dress is one of them, you name it. So this Valentino, I have not done many of these. Um, it's always my goal to do as many as I can. Um, and I plan on doing at least a couple more in the next couple of years. They are worth the energy and time because the product that you end up with is just, it's like the details are so thoughtfully caref carefully planned out and, and executed. And if you follow their directions exactly, you end up with a beautiful piece. So this was my inspiration piece right here. I decided not to go for the black. And so what I ended up with was a very similar looking jacquard knit design that looks very similar to the pattern itself. I don't wear the hat though, and I don't wear the gloves, but I do have a, a couple of belts that I wear with it. The, um, the the choice of knit I think was a good one for me because it allows for the look of the original jacquard. That's probably just actually uh, a regular jacquard. It's not one that's a knit, and so this little tiny model can fit her hips into <laughs> into something like that. That's not a knit and is rather uh, a woven cloth, which to me sounds just no. But this. Um, the jacquard knit makes it fit very precisely on me in the same size that I have this in, but it doesn't um, require my poor hips to feel like they're being constrained if I sit down. So that's why I ended up choosing the jacquard knit. And this again is another fabric marked piece. And it has all the things, all the makings and trappings of a couture design because of the pieces I'll show you in just a minute. So here is the instructions as they are. By the way, I chose the size 12, which back then was a bust of 34 and a hip of 36. But on this particular design, the skirt itself has just a bit of like extra give. So the hips end up being, I believe the measurement at the fullest point is around 44 or so. So it's a, it's a little bit wider of a skirt. And so here is the design as it's laid out. And for those of us who are used to having to like take paper after paper after paper and look through the directions, the nice thing about these Portier ones and the um, Vogue originals from Paris is that they're all printed on one sheet, which is amazing because you don't have to keep searching for the instructions. And they do a really good job of detailing things. Um, this one was meant to have an underlining, but because it was a jacquard knit and very thick, I knew I didn't need one. So I, I eschewed the underlining. But if you do it in something that's a little bit more thin, you'd want the underlining for sure. Um, they, I was very nervous, I recall, in cutting the pockets because I just did not understand how I was gonna get from cutting into the very nice fabric to the portion where it would all come together perfectly. And I was like, this better be right. So I was like thinking to myself, here I have to cut into the fabric like this. And I'm thinking like, oh my goodness, I, if this doesn't work, it's gonna look terrible. Well, I did what they asked and it ended up coming together very nicely. And here in the pockets, um, the pockets are here. They're attached nicely at the side. They have, you can barely see it, but you can see it kind of becomes this beautiful princess scene. 
and then connects up to the portion up here. And somehow in all of this, a waistband is created where you have belt loops, by the way. Um, so it's very like, <laughs> it's a complicated pattern, but it's done so nicely, the description in the directions, that it if you follow them very carefully, you look very carefully at what you're doing, you end up with the piece where you have all these very distinct details. And so here's the pocket here. And um, I'll go ahead and show it to you from the inside as well. By the way, the back is my, I love the back too. I did another one where you have a beautiful button and it has a little bit of elastic closure. So it's easy to get on and off and I don't have to bother my children to help me zip up or <laughs> do the uh, work of unbuttoning or buttoning me. So from the inside out, you'll see just how kind of complicated it is but it's a neat, like I really love the way the designer did it. So this is of course Valentino himself um, or one of his minions who took the name Valentino for him. So on the front, you'll see how it has, the pockets are here. Mm -hmm. And there is, you see how it came together right here. It even has the pleating on the front is part of this whole patterning design with the pocket and the Pleating in the front allows there to be some room for the bust, which is just really cool. Like the, the amount of, I, I would love to be a pattern maker because some of these people are really, really good at it. And then of course here's the yoke and then the cowl neck. And you'll note that I added in the, the Vogue Cotillo design um, label came with it. Back then, if you bought them and you use them, you could put, they, they included labels with all of them. And um, so this one had it in there. And so I was like, I'm absolutely gonna use it because it is a Vogue Cartier design. And then on the front, you see the belt loops here. Excuse me, this is the back belt loops down here. The back belt loops are here. Okay. And so that is my labor of love that turned out well. I wear this often, I love it. It always looks really cool when I wear it. Um, I've worn it actually with um, at like Christmas parties with gray tights and like an under like a gray turtleneck or a gray long sleeve shirt. Um, I've worn it just on its own. Um, it is more versatile than you'd think it would be because it's, it's got it's got the ability to be worn in the summer because it's sleeveless but it's got that jumper style so it can be worn in the winter, spring, and fall as well. And so that is why this one is my absolute favorite. And it's a combo of, I can wear it often. It has the really cool couture elements that make it a very special design. I did spend a lot of time on it and energy that I think was well worth it. And so that is why it's my most favorite ever. I really hope that you enjoyed the pictures because they're gonna be coming up and I am Really glad that you were able to stick around to number one. It was a little bit of a video. So go ahead and enjoy the photos of the process and um, the pictures of them on me here. Thank you for sticking around if you chose to stick around. I made sure to add the time down below um, to make sure that if you have, were just interested in one of the patterns or one of the styles that you were able to just quickly go to that one instead of watching all seven of the pieces. These were definitely labors of love. They were definitely worth all the energy I spent on them. And I hope that if you are sorry, you are inspired to do some really unique, special things in your own um, sewing. A journey, if you will. And um, even though I tend to go towards more of the simple pieces now, just because I don't have as much time as I used to, although this COVID thing is making me have more time than I'm used to, so I might get back into more of these couture ones this summer. Um, I do find myself very proud of the seven pieces I created because they all took so much energy and effort and love and just really really proud that i made them and um, if you have on your youtube a place where you'd like me to take a look at some of the work you've done i would love to check out other people's work i'm always inspired by other people's sewing projects people are really creative and, and 
things they come up with when they create items are just spectacular. So I would love to see what you have. If this interests you and, and you like what I do, you can go ahead and subscribe down below. And if you have content and you subscribe to me, and I know you subscribe to me, then I will subscribe right back. More than happy to do that. Y'all have a great day and I look forward to seeing you in my next sewing journey, fabric journey, whatever I decide to do. And uh, we'll see you soon.